Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, we are uh, dealing with the climate change um, topic, um, obviously um, very high on the agenda at the moment, um, particularly with COP26 um, starting uh, very imminently in Glasgow and us all um, very eager and enthusiastic to uh, find out how positive an outcome um, we've got from that. Um, but as a planning live event, we wanted to focus on, well, what does it mean for planners? How should planners be um, getting involved? How should planners be reacting? How can planners move things forward? Um, uh, so we've titled the session today, Climate Change, How is the Role of the Planner Changing? Um, just to pull all of those threads together. Um, my colleagues, Kendra and Molly, um, I'm going to pass over to them in a minute um, to actually run the session, uh, but delighted to welcome our guests today, um, Rhiannon and Sean, who are co-chairs of the Scottish Young Planners Network. Um, we've been very keen. Uh, we um, uh, ran a session uh, last year with the Young Planners Network, very keen um, to, to collaborate with them uh, because it is very easy uh, for these events um, to involve the people um, who have uh, a lot of experience under their belt, which is a coded way of saying they're old. <laughs> um, I, I, and, and experience is interesting uh, and experience is important, but we're always very eager to get a range of views. And that's why we're always very keen to work with the Young Planners Network um, to, to harness um, those views just so that we do get um, the variety of perspectives. So delighted to, to welcome Rhiannon and Sean um, and, and just to explain um, that um, as well as being co-chairs, um, they do of course have uh, a working life. Rhiannon uh, is uh, a planning consultant with um, uh, a, a consultancy. Sean um, is uh, with Glasgow Council and it may well be on the way through the session, they might refer to um, aspects that they're involved in in their working lives um, just to stress to save them having to mention it obviously anything they say is a personal view and it's not necessarily uh, representative of their organizations but I think it is always interesting um, to be able to refer to things that people have come across or are possibly involved in in their working day as it were. Um, so uh, thank you again to Rhiannon and Sean um, and thank you to Kendra and Molly for what they're about to do and handing over to you all. And I'm just um, going to go off the video and sit and enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Neil. So as Neil said, today's topic is, of course, climate change. How is the role of the planner changing? Um, and the climate emergency, of course, uh, influences or uh, is at least part of the conversation um, or discussion in so many decisions and conversations no more so now than than with COP26 on the horizon. It's, I think that's this year's buzz concept or buzzword. Um, and I think it's fair to say that it's important now, perhaps more than ever before, for the planning profession to really highlight its contribution and, and the role of uh, how and the role of planning and how that can uh, what role that can have in tackling climate change and, and then the race to net zero, particularly as people, you know, governments, industries and uh, individuals are listening and they seem increasingly receptive and, and serious about taking meaningful action. So with that said, and, and against the backdrop of the climate emergency, Rhiannon and Sean, um, if I could ask, first of all, how you see the role of the planner influencing what happens from here, or perhaps the question is, how would you like to see uh, the role of the planner influence things going forward? Uh, Rhiannon, maybe go to you first. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all very aware that the government are keen to promote a green economic recovery, and planning really has to lie at the heart of this. Um, in, in my view, key to this will be designing sustainable places, which encourage sustainable travel, incorporate low and zero carbon generating technologies, and make efficient use of our lands and resources. It's essential that development takes a place-based approach, which looks to meet the needs of our communities and create healthy places. It's, it's not just that consideration that needs to be given to the way we use our places and our resources, and how we interact with our spaces. And good planning can help facilitate behaviour changes such as a reduction in car use, all of which will help respond to the climate emergency. The role of planners really will be central to this and should have huge influence in our response to climate change. 
We all know that planners play an essential role bridging gaps between social, economic and environmental benefits to create new sustainable places which meet the needs of communities. So it's key that the government look to the future and the ways in which we can evolve and develop to build in climate resilience. And planning and planners will be essential to this. Thanks, Jenny. I agree entirely. Sean, what about yourself? How do you see the, or how would you like to see the role of the planner influence what happens going forward from, from now? Well, first of all, I agree with what um, Rhiannon just said. I think um, at heart, the planning profession, um, we are collaborators. Um, we work together with others to pull together um, responses to some big issues, short term and long term. And I think that obviously includes the climate. And I think we're working towards that well. Um, I know that we're probably going to come on later to talk a bit about development planning and maybe development management and other aspects of planning. And I thought maybe it'd be quite useful to give a, an example just now of something else that planners get involved in, and that is about economic development. Um, mm -hmm. It's maybe not always seen as an obvious um, area that planners work in, um, but one of the, the things I think that's changing alongside uh, climate policy is economic policy as well. And Scotland is obviously part of the Economic Wellbeing Alliance, for example, um, and hopefully we'll start to see some policies filtering through from that soon. In my own project that I work on in Glasgow City Council, for example, um, I've just been working on a um, on a first for Scotland, which is a, a nature-based um, enterprise accelerator program. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to work on that through the Horizon 2020 project, Connecting Nature. Um, this is where we put together a, a partnership with um, internal services and also external bodies as well to put on a, a program that would support um, a number of uh, entrepreneurs, nature-based entrepreneurs, what we call them. And uh, we supported them over a three-month period, and, and they've just recently launched their enterprises. And the, the point of this was to um, find an innovative way economic landscape that would help us support our open space strategy in Glasgow as well. Um, there's a lot more to it and it probably could take a whole webinar discussing that but I wanted to give it a, an example of something a bit more uh, innovative perhaps or, or different, something you maybe wouldn't think of necessarily that planners would get involved in but that's the sort of thing that um, I think and I hope we'll see planners get involved in more as we, um, as we continue to take a lead role with the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely and certainly um, tangible examples are always are always good to to draw from and perhaps others will will follow Glasgow's example um I suppose you mentioned development planning uh, touching on development planning by it by its very nature planning practice is rooted or or is driven by policy and Scottish planning policy was, of course makes it clear that Scottish government is committed to sustainable development um how do, how important do you think sustainable development will be um in guiding planning practice as we try to navigate the climate emergency Rhiannon do you have any comments on that yeah so I mean, really, the response to climate change, it has to be centred on sustainable development. And at its core, this, this really just means make, making sure that any development meets the needs of current generations as well as the needs of future generations. And um, personally, I think that too often sustainable, sustainable development is a bit of an afterthought with people thinking how they can make a development more sustainable. And while this can be applauded, I think what we need to do is go back to the beginning and think how can we make it sure it developments in a sustainable location and it's fully informed by the principles of sustainable development rather than as an add-on. Mm -hmm. um, so to do that I think we need to carefully consider the ways in which we use our land and options, think about opportunities for urban densification, reuse and redevelopment of vacant land um, and a bit of forward thinking to ensure that buildings are adaptable and future-proofed. Mm -hmm. Do you think plan making has an important role to play in all of that? Yeah, I think it'll be essential for it really. Um, so development plans, we need to make sure that they encourage high density development, that they promote um, development in towns and cities, the, the redevelopment of vacant and derelict land. All those key principles will come through the development plans. But there's also a need to ensure there's some flexibility built into the policy approach, particularly with the introduction of 10 year plans. We need to make sure there's enough flexibility to adapt to the latest technologies and emerging um, principles that we might see coming out. If you think of Sean's example of nature-based solutions if, if that was in a plan from 10 years ago it's mm -hmm. so I, I'm not sure if that's a fairly new concept Sean you might be able to add a bit more to that but that might not have been something that was discussed 10 years ago yeah. so we need to make sure there's 
the flexibility and approach to development planning. Yeah, I totally agree, uh, Rhiannon. Um, it's nature-based solutions, I think, actually, um, in some ways, have been around for quite a long time. Um, it's maybe just a, a catch-all term that we're now using um, in certain circles to describe a whole variety of interventions that have actually already been um, uh, have been happening for a while and maybe have been in policy, but maybe just not being that explicit about it, though. Um, and just come back to the, the um, earlier point and what Leanne was saying there, I think planners do have a um, a key role here with development planning and, and policy making. Um, the circular economy, I think we often think about um, in terms of recycling and, and plastics and so on, that's obviously mm -hmm. really important. But Rihanna mentioned there about land and buildings, and we have to think about land and buildings in that context as well. Um, Glasgow and, and the Central Belt of Scotland has obviously got a massive issue with vacant and dirt land, for example, mm -hmm. and we really do need long-term policy making um, that will see that, that land brought back into use um, for a whole variety of reasons, um, but crucially for, for climate change. A lot of these sites are actually uh, important areas for biodiversity enhancement, for example, or habitat connections, and that needs to be filtered into um, our policies across a whole range of policies, particularly housing as well, so that we're um, creating sites that uh, have all these uh, policies and aspects and factors uh, intertwined within them so we get proper spaces that are multifunctional and can be used um, to, to water manage or create better biodiversity and habitats and so on. Yeah. Um, and I just going to say quickly on the technology point as well, um, I think we, we do need to think about taking a, a more serious and, and data-led approach to policy making because that's what's going to be um, the key to opening up meaningful policy in the long term, in my view, in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely strays beyond any one sector, doesn't it? And I think the need for that holistic sort of in the round approach um, it, it is really important. I suppose it really all, all almost begs the question as to whether we think our existing policy framework really provides a good foundation or are there ways that we could maybe adapt it to better uh, deal with or address the climate emergency? Um, what do you think about that, Rianne and Sean, either? Yes, I do think it does provide a, a pretty solid framework and it's, it's definitely something to, to build upon. Um, I think more could still be done. And to be honest, a lot of it's probably beyond the remit of of planning and beyond my expertise um, but there definitely needs to be further funding in particular to support the reuse and redevelopment of vacant and derelict land um, particularly in con constrained sites within existing settlements and communities more needs to be done to release that land and based an asset really as, mm -hmm. as Scott, Sean said the, the push towards the circular economy needs to consider the land use as well mm -hmm. um, so that's maybe more of a funding thing rather than a policy framework but I think we need to continue to encourage a policy, policy approach which encourages sustainable development and green solutions. But as I said, we need to ensure that we're incorporating enough flexibility to allow the policies to adapt to the latest technology and mm -hmm. respond to the, the data findings, as mm -hmm. Sean said. Yeah, and what I think that what planning needs is teeth. Um, I know that what Leanne was saying there is that we actually do have quite good policies in place and, and frameworks and so on, but maybe the one of the issues that we have is, is that we are not always able to deliver upon them because we obviously rely on a whole um, variety of different sectors and partners that we work with to deliver on those policies. Um, but what I would say, though, is, is that um, from what we've seen so far of the MPF4, the National Planning Framework 4, I don't know if we'll come on to that later, uh, from the position statement that was released by the government last year um, does give me a bit of optimism about the direction of travel that we're heading in terms of uh, policies that will um, help us secure a more positive future for the environment, um, for example. I understand that the draft MPS4 is imminent and we're all on the edge of our seats waiting for that to be released so we can get a good look at it. Um, but I am hopeful about that, that planning will then be able to take a, a, a more of a a stronger lead with this cross-sectoral lead mm -hmm. um, of course if we're resource but I guess we'll come on to the challenges later too <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah it, it certainly does sound promising it feels like there really is a captive audience at the moment um, and I don't know if it's um, 
I don't know if it, if it's as a result of people um, having maybe a bit more time to think about it after the last 18 months or, you know, it's the, the imminent arrival of, of COP26, but certainly the, it does feel like there is a shift in, in, in focus and there's a real um, commitment to, to, to making positive change for all of this, so, which, is, which is good. Um, I suppose moving from development uh, planning to development management, um, you touched on uh, data earlier, Sean. Are are there any ways that you would like to see de decision making changing or improvements that you um, th that you think could be made to take better account of climate change and and the climate emergency? Yeah, well, I mean, I worked in development management for a number of years. Um, I don't anymore, but I know the the pressures that um, development management colleagues are under um, to take policy and, and apply it in quite a, a tricky context sometimes the pressure is coming from all over the place um, but in relation to um, to data uh, I think that we're not there yet um, in terms of being able to have useful and meaningful and well managed data to help us make rounded decisions that are um, are not as challengeable shall we say Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, again, you know, we're moving in that direction. Uh, my issue is, though, is that sometimes we're moving in that direction perhaps too slowly um, and that we maybe need um, some, some leadership, perhaps, um, to make sure that we're, we're getting the right data that we need and managed well enough into the longer term um, to assist with making proper decision making at development management. Um, but I mean, there's obviously the smart city concept and so on. There's different data sets that are happening all over the place in, in relation to health, um, society, environment, economic. And I think what we need is um, some sort of hub or service that pulls all those things together so that um, we can be confident that the data that we're using is um, up to date and reliable. Um, because I think at this point, we maybe aren't uh, there yet on that, mm -hmm. in, in my experience, um, of, of using data. Yeah, it's maybe maybe a call for someone to take real ownership of that to, like you say, ensure that we are looking at reliable data. Do you have any examples of data being used in decision making and and how that how that improved the decision making in any in any context? Yeah, sure. Um, I, there's a couple of really good examples actually just now. Um, uh, I've just uh, written. Our, uh, Rani, uh, Rihanna and I just wrote some articles for the Planner magazine, so a shameless plug there. Um, I've just written an article about um, uh, data, actually, and there's some good examples in that. And one of them um, is um, the Green Heat and Green Spaces project that our colleagues at Green Space Scotland have been working on, which is a phenomenal project, actually, which has looked at open spaces across the whole of Scotland. Um, assess them for the potential for providing renewable heat sources from below the ground mm -hmm. in order to heat uh, buildings and facilities around those spaces. So they could be parks or they could be rivers, for example, as well. Um, and that is an amazing data source which is um, being produced at the moment. Some of it is open and available to the public, some of it isn't quite there yet. Um, but I hope that that will be a, a, a data set that will be. Um, that will have, you know, a, a hugely positive effect on some of the decision making that planners make. Um, there's another example actually which is uh, for, from London which is the Go Parks London uh, webpage which is a GIS map. Um, it was the Greater London Authority and the National Park City campaign who have worked over the last couple of years to produce this. Um, a really intuitive easy to use um, service where you can go onto the GIS web-based map and find a green space or an open park um, and to get a whole range of information in relation to what events happen on that park, how you, you can get involved with community groups that are around there, how you can access it, but actually travel it, for example, what sort of biodiversity exists on that site. Mm -hmm. A whole range of different um, data sets that have come together to be able to give you a much more informed um, picture of what you can do on those sites. And I would like to see something like that happen in Glasgow. And actually, we are working on something similar. Um, oh, so great. there is lots of good stuff happening. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> We had a question in from um, uh, Ian Cowan, uh, but you've possibly perhaps in part uh, answered it and he's asking what kind of data do you mean, but I suppose it could be a range of things, you know, the, the mapping um, that you mentioned and, and other things, but is yeah. that right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess what I mean by that is a whole range of different information, I suppose, mm -hmm. and 
information in relation to environment, so um, you know, flood risk zones, uh, the expected rate of flooding and uh, the uh, level of rainfall in particular areas, I guess would be an example, but also if you look at health as well, we want to know things like um, societal impacts too, so we need to know data sets on uh, various aspects of individuals' health, for example, that could be mental health or physical health, like heart disease. Um, or it could be in relation to SIMD data, for example, so we know where uh, areas of deep dep deprivation are and where we need to have particular interventions to help assist with those issues. But I think it's about looking, as you said before, holistically at all these things. Um, at the moment, we have got a, ro a range of um, data sets, lots of data actually, which is great, but they're not necessarily looked at coherently enough to make sure that we're making well-rounded decisions across the country. Um, and I think that's what I'm calling for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sean, could I just add to that? that I think you make a really valid point. It can be really difficult sometimes to know where to find the right data and the right mm -hmm. information. Um, so I think key to it will be making sure that there's um, data transparency, transparency and that everyone has access to the mm -hmm. data particularly if it's going to inform decision making at a DM level. Mm -hmm. One of the things we need to know is for one how much weight it's, it's given in decision making. I think that there should always be transparency in any decision making but I think it's not just about DM it's decision making for developers as well so mm -hmm. if they don't have access to the data they can't design around constraints mm -hmm. or or benefits and enhancements it can be really mm -hmm. difficult to incorporate that at a kind of initial stage if you don't have the information at that level at that point in time yeah. um, which is why often some of it can come a bit late in the game and it, it's already designed scheme but you didn't know that there was potential for mm -hmm. xyz because you didn't have access to that data so yeah mm -hmm. sean i would totally agree there's a need for almost a central hub for all this mm -hmm. to be stored but i'm not sure if that's for a planner to do or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, definitely not me mm -hmm. I know it's easy to think about decision making just from the decision makers perspective, but actually yeah. you have to think about the people who are who are also using the planning system as well, don't you? The, the yeah, developers and the, and the actual people who will use these developments at the end of the day. Um, yeah. I suppose that's a good um, venture into a very specific um, but practical example of the, the sort of dichotomy that we can sometimes see between climate change and planning. Um, and that's a, a sort of drive through hot food and, and coffee shops as a specific example. And do you think those are, um, it, that's something where planners need to look beyond the popularity aspect and focus on the inherent car use uh, that's involved and, you know, should councils be maybe refusing applications now or should they be, be waiting for ministers to really address that as a as a specific policy? Um, what, what do you think? If I can throw it out to Sean maybe first. <laughs> Uh, yeah, quite controversial, I guess. Um, and just going back to my comments that I made earlier about my colleagues in development management, I, I think um, for these particular types of developments, it, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because, mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about sustainable communities and um, working towards uh, the twenty-minute neighbourhood concept and all that, and and the place they can, uh, the, sorry, the place principle and so on. And in my view, um, coffee shop drive-throughs don't really you know, comply with any of those sorts of concepts or aspirations that we have mm -hmm. for better urban planning, really, for a whole variety of reasons. I mean, um, they tend to be um, run by multinationals, and I, and I guess you could argue good points and bad points for multinationals. Um, but really, uh, from what I can see, uh, they don't seem to be that carbon neutral in terms of their behaviours or even their bills, for example. It's not often you see... Um, uh, a drive through with a green roof, for example, or, or green walls. Um, and uh, maybe if we did, they'd be less controversial. So I think there there is an issue there. Um, and they probably do represent a bit of a conflict, actually, between um, building regs, for example, and what they require, and planning policy aspirations, too. So, um, yeah, and just, I guess, a related point to that as well is that I think at the moment, um, electric cars are being seen as the panacea to everything. And if, if only everyone switches to electric, I mean, in my view, I, I don't think that necessarily is the whole answer. Um, they still require energy, they still need to be made. Um, they still require towns and cities and, and urban areas to be designed around the car and therefore less around active travel, for example. Uh, and there's all sorts of issues in relation to the battery production and so on. I'm not gonna go into it again in this webinar, but I think in total though, I think this overall, um, 
yeah, I'm going to pass over to, to Rhiannon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Make a conclusion. laughs> I, I think, as you said, Sean, you can see the conflict there, but there is wider issues at hand. Um, obviously, it's a, it is a car-driven use. It's potentially quite unsustainable, but they are built to meet demand. So there is demand for them. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it all has to link back to our places and our communities and how do we ensure that we're rege regenerating these places to reduce demand for travel and making sure that communities mm -hmm. are built with the services within them so that people don't mm -hmm. feel the need to go out for the drive through coffee unless they're on a motorway in a long drive, in which case it mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but there needs to be a balance and I don't think a blanket ban on any type of use is ever going to work su successfully. Each application needs to be considered in its own merits and I, personally I wouldn't support any type of blanket ban. Yeah. But I think you need to go down to the behaviour of it and why people are using it and it's essentially because they don't have it in their communities or they don't have it mm -hmm. with an easy access to their communities so it's, it's taking it back to basics to think of the behaviour change and how planning can influence that rather than just saying but well, we'll just not build them. Yeah, absolutely. When you take yeah. it down to the granular level, it's about how we are all using our space and, and yeah. spending our time, essentially, really. Like yeah. you say, they, they are built to serve demand. So maybe exactly. we need to look, look, at, look at the mirror before we start thinking about any uh, policy, policy <laughs> um, blanket policies on it. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's interesting to get uh, Rhiannon's view of that as somebody who works in private consultancy, because that was a really valid point, actually, that I actually missed. Um, what I was going to say though was maybe what we should be doing is designing these around bikes um, so that you cycle through rather than drive through. But... <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's anything to stop you cycling through a drive through. Maybe not, yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I think we possibly could start a different debate about it all, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sean, you mentioned. Uh, earlier data and, and decision making. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A actually, which we, which we might pick up. Um, I suppose it might it might be sensible to pick one of those up just now. And, and someone's asked how um, the data that we're talking about earlier, how that should be weighted in decision making. Um, and the point is being made that I suppose everything has an impact. Um, what, what's yeah. your take on weighting and mm. decision making? Well, I mean, I guess it depends, you know, on the individual circumstances, and that might seem like a bit of a cop out. Um, but to be a bit controversial, um, you know, what I would say that is that arguably what we should be doing is giving really a lot of weight to environmental based data. Um, I, I think we give a lot of weight to particular aspects uh, when it comes to making plan decisions and development management. For example, road safety is a huge concern and can often ch change the, uh, the recommendation on a, on a development proposal. Um, I think maybe what I would suggest is going forward, what we should also be doing is looking at the impact on biodiversity, for example, on the site, which I think just now is not really given um, a huge amount of weight. I mean, it is given weight, obviously, and an increasing so, actually. Um, but I would say that I think we get need to get to a point where uh, the loss of biodiversity on the site needs to be given almost as much weight as something like something like wood safety. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not quite there yet, I guess, with that. But again, it does relate to, it does have to go back to the individual circumstances of what we're talking about here. Uh, I mean, long-term policy, for example, probably should be focusing on health and societal issues um, as well. But when we're talking about development proposals, there'll be an economic factor to consider. And so economic data might be the, mm -hmm. uh, the priority in that case. Um, so it does depend. Yeah, we've, um, we've had a question actually about the health perspectives and I guess, Sean, if you're um, speaking about that just now, in terms of health impact assessments, what kind of weighting would those have? Um, well, in terms of development management, do you mean? I mean, it's not, it's not, not my area of expertise, I have to say. Um, but as I just said there, uh, I think if we're looking to develop long-term sustainable communities, particularly in cities like Glasgow, for example, which are pretty um, high density. I think that people's health and well-being is a massive concern. Mm -hmm. We've seen that over the pandemic, um, access to green space and, and quality space had a massive impact on people's health and well-being. And I think that that's something that we need to factor in uh, in, in longer term policy making. And that's what we're actually doing in Glasgow at the moment. Um, I'm not sure that answers the question. Can I just add to that? I think it's, it's really mm. interesting that a lot of the questions seem to be asking about what weight you would give to data or to the health impact assessment. 
and it's really difficult to, to say that and to give a definitive answer because at the end of the day planning has to you, you have to come to a balanced decision that considers the social the economic the environment and you have to take all that in turn to make a decision on a proposal or on how you're going to proceed with development or even how how you're going to promote a plan and it you need to have all that information there to make the balanced decision and it is going to be very site specific because there's different circumstances for each site and I think it would be really difficult to set a level of well this has to be given more priority over that because you wouldn't know unless it was specific to that location or that community mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, there, I think there does have to be a kind of wider appreciation of not just the data and the type of data you have but it's it's that balance between the environmental, social, and economic considerations. Mm -hmm. Weighing it all in the balance, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose loosely, loosely connected to data, perhaps um, the digital transformation of the Scottish planning system. I think it's probably fairly described as still being a work in progress. But just following on the the discussion around data and using data and decision making, um, how important do you think the the digital transformation is in this context? Then, Sean, if I could ask you first. Yeah, um, well, obviously hugely um, important. Um, I think that there's, there's going to be you know, massive benefits, not just to planners and to consultants and other people who, who normally engage with the planning system at the moment, but to the general public really as well. I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges with planning that I've found um, in my career so far is that not a lot of people know what planning is. <laughs> and I think one of the reasons, that, and that's a shame, really, because I think that planning has a massive impact on everyone's life, and actually it's a really rewarding career as well. Um, but I think that if we do have a digital planning system that is intuitive and easy to use and accessible and people know about it, then that will go a long way in helping us promote the profession and, and help us get better decisions ultimately by having more people involved. Um, though I think there, there's more to it than that in terms of the context of of climate, I think if we've got a digital planning service um, that is coherently using um, data. Example, I'm not going to go on about data too much anymore. But um, if we're if we if we've got a coherent digital planning system, then there's a whole range of different benefits that we could expect to see in the context of climate, such as um, low lower energy demand, for example, by the ability to use um, data management uh, and engagement to plan for efficient accessibility. But homes and jobs, for example, um, better integrated in local energy supplies and the ability to use spatial data and engagement in the private sector, um, communities and statutory consultees as well, lower transport demand and emissions by better designed um, urban areas to reduce the, the, um, the need to travel by different modes, um, and also the better better collaboration with building regulations, I would say too, which again is moving in a, in a good direction or positive direction in this context. Mm -hmm. And I think that if uh, digital planning can um, work together with those sorts of services, we'll get overall much better decisions in terms of climate change. Um, there's loads, loads more as well, but um, mm -hmm. let, let Rhiannon respond as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say at, at a basic level there's there is some issues and we're all aware of it it's it's not a particularly digital friendly system at the minute and um, so it is essential that it continues to evolve but it is really interesting that we can see some of the changes that have come out of the system particularly with with covid and the shift to online events and online mm -hmm. consultation events and as sean said a lot of the time it's making the information easier to find and more available for communities so we've experienced it through our digital consultation events that haven't having the web page and having the, the digital events, it, it makes it easier for someone to just drop in and ask an, ask a mm -hmm. question rather than if they had to visit the site or the building or, or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. Um, but a lot more work needs done, um, particularly to ensure the kind of end-to-end -end digital planning experience. I mm -hmm. suppose a really minor thing is this massive bugbear, but you can only upload upload a five megabyte file. And it's it's, yeah. it's not it's not very user friendly so there's there's really small interventions like that which will free up time and resource which I mean it's well known that planners are under resourced both in particularly in the public sector but also in the private sector and stuff like having to sit and split up a huge document into five megabyte chunks and upload each individual file I mean there's so much that could be done to streamline the process and I think that that will have knock-on impacts for stuff like validation teams and mm -hmm. And the vetting officers who are going through a document, it's much easier to look, oh, well, there's the design and access statement. I've got it all because it's one mm -hmm. file. 
people rather than split into 18 parts. So, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, definitely not made myself any <laughs> friends on occasions of meeting. Uh, one, you know, they see yeah. the, the trail of emails starting one of uh, however many emails are, are going to come in. And I yeah. suppose there's a bit of an irony in all of this, isn't there? Because we talk when we talk about climate change and sustainable development, we're talking about safeguarding the planet for future generations. And of mm -hmm. course, future generations are of you know that it's a digital generation now and we're almost Definitely. playing catch up to keep up with the future generations so the, I suppose the, yeah. the quicker it happens the better really isn't it in all of yeah. this. As a slight aside it's it's really interesting to hear that kind of chat of how do you get the younger generation involved in planning mm -hmm. um, and I remember a couple of years back at one of the Scottish planners conference it was something as simple as they had an app and it had developments on it and you swipe mm -hmm. right or left if you liked it and it's, <laughs> yeah. it's just thinking of solutions like that of how you can use technology yeah. to make planning more approachable almost mm -hmm. because for a lot of people they think oh I don't I don't know about that that's not for mm -hmm. me but actually it's, it's their places and their towns and their communities so it's right that they should be able to have a say and yeah. to find an easy way to do that. Absolutely. It's tangible, isn't it? It affects how you yeah. travel to work, where you work, where you go to school, how, you know, exactly. the building that you sit in, you know, it affects absolutely everyone. And unfortunately, it's about, I think for me, it's really important to get, you know, that whole engagement piece much earlier in the process, because quite often people yeah. only feel that they're really affected when it, it's sort of hitting them in the face, you know, in yeah. the point they, they, they almost lost the opportunity to get involved in the sort of plan making and decision making so um yeah I absolutely agree that there are there there are definitely ways and means to to get people and particularly younger generations involved in the planning system much earlier i think that would mm -hmm. be that would be really good i suppose just a couple of, of, of questions just to round off to the discussion today before we pick up any other that have come through the q a um we've mentioned uh, it before very briefly, uh, but I think it'd probably be remiss of us not to ask about COP26, um, given that it starts on Sunday, but what do you think um, can, can or, or, or should come out of, of COP26? Sean, I'll let you go first there. Um, well, uh, I think, first of all, I think it's fantastic that it's happening in Scotland and, and in Glasgow. I think it's great to see Glasgow and the world stage like this. Um, there's a small part of me that's maybe a bit sceptical about what we're going to achieve from it, if I'm going to be completely honest. Um, however, I think for for planning, I mean, planning will um, be represented in a number of ways over the COP climate uh, conference, which is great to see. Um, Rhiannon and I have been busy over the last few months involved in a whole variety of different um, events and writing those articles and so on. And we're just about to deliver our climate focused conference tomorrow in Edinburgh. So I think that um, on the back of COP, um, I think what we want to see, what I want to see anyway, is planners really taking the, the leadership role here in dealing with the climate crisis across a whole range of areas. Um, we talked earlier about planners being the collaborators, and that's great, but I think we also need to be the leaders mm -hmm. as well. And from what I can see from the, the things that Rihanna and I get asked to get involved in, I can see us moving in the right direction with that, with our PIs, Scotland and RTI UK as well and others as well um, so I'm going to remain hopeful because I'm an optimist um, <laughs> I hope we get some um, some phenomenal agreement that we'll be able to work towards and realistically deliver um, in time um, and from the back of that I hope that planners take the lead role in, in helping to deliver on whatever is agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brianna what about yourself? Yeah, so if I was to take a wee bit of a step away from planning and think of personally what, what would I like to see? So I think too often the emphasis is on the individual and what can a person do to make their house, their behaviours more sustainable. But I actually think a lot of it's huge corporations that are just not pulling their weight in the response to climate change. So I'd like to see something stronger coming, coming down that way. But thinking specifically from a place-based approach, we're already seeing incremental changes in behaviours and I'm optimistic um, that this will continue. I think a lot of it's naturally occurred actually as a result of COVID-19 and trying mm -hmm. to see the silver lining and be the, not be an optimist. I think that's mm -hmm. the, the benefit of that is that people have seen how good their communities and their local towns and neighbourhoods could be. Mm -hmm. So really my hope is that this will be a drive for behaviour change whereby people live more locally it reduces demand for travel and that all will have positive impacts on climate change but it will also have a huge impact on how we plan and it really should be 
national kind of planning policy and, and our approach mm-hmm. moving forward that we are thinking about that kind of sustainable way of living mm-hmm. that makes it easier for the individual to do those minor behavior changes so that there's less of a, a focus on you know, have you split up your recycling have you whatever installed a heat pump whatever the latest thing yeah, is that you, you're meant to do for yourself when actually there should be ways that make it easier to live more sustainably mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also for the sort of individuals, it can become quite overwhelming to to think of yeah. all the things that you should be doing or um or that you, that you could be doing. I suppose yeah. from I suppose personally from like Sean, I'm a bit skeptical about um thinking of COP26 as as a bit of a silver bullet, but yeah. you would, you appreciate that global interaction and global um cooperation is hugely important, particularly for the most um vulnerable and the most at risk so um but hopefully we'll see lots of uh, lots of good things coming out of it um just conscious of time um i'm just going to ask molly do you think there are any other are there any other questions in the q and a that we um, we would yeah. have time for maybe one or two to before we're cut off <laughs> yeah we've got quite a lot um i suppose uh Rianne and you were talking about um urban density mm-hmm. and We've had a question um, recognizing that that's important, um, but with the suggestion that um, measures to make that style of living more affordable um, in terms of rent and also property value um, to curb kind of suburbanization and the need to travel. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's it's really difficult to, to make any type of housing affordable at the minute, it seems. Mm. Um, again, it's it's not something I know enough about to be able to give an informed opinion on, but I can totally appreciate the position. And um, if it was more affordable to live in the city centre, more people would do it. But it should also, um, I think a lot of that comes down to land availability as well and making sure that the sites are there in the city centre for developers to build out. Because a lot of the time these city centre sites are previously developed, so they're quite constrained. Mm-hmm. So there's quite a lot of abnormals on them, um, which, can then influence the costs so it's making sure that if there is a vacant site in a central location that there's again I, I don't know the solution to it and I don't know what the right way is but it's looking at funding sources or if there's anything we can do to free up the vacant and derelict land in our cities which will allow housing to be built with it within them and, and on these sites mm-hmm. I don't know if that really answers the question but <laughs> I've tried <laughs> Just, just a quick point in relation to that as well, just on the back of the um, pandemic and all of us home working now, we might start to see some some more space freeing up in urban areas that was previously office space. And what I would quite like to see is yeah. that office space, if it's rather than lying empty, but getting converted into um, generously sized and portioned uh, residential accommodation so it can accommodate all sorts of people, families, single people and so on, with genuine usable outside space as well. So maybe um, that will be that will lead to um, a different sort of market opening up, and maybe one that's more affordable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I'll I'll jump in now because um, we are um, pretty much at um, wrap up time. Um, so just to um, thank you all, but in in terms of the wrapping up. Um, a couple of things I, I, I scribbled down, which I thought really sort of summed it up. Um, Sean's comment about planners as, as leaders and, and um, would very much uh, echo what you were saying about the work that the RTPI have done um, in really um, moving things forward and, and giving planners a much higher profile. Um, and then as Rhiannon was saying, um, it all being about the drive for behaviour change and uh, it, it's always fascinating and I don't want to start a whole new discussion but um, to what extent is it planning about um, a, just the big stick um, and, and telling people well, you can't do that as a, a blunt way of driving behaviour change um, or if there's a more positive way of doing it and that's I suppose bringing in more of the plan making function and providing opportunities and, and driving the change that way but um, uh, Rhiannon and Sean, thanks. That was a really um, fascinating discussion, covered a, a lot of ground and, and um, it was very obvious from the questions that were coming up um, that people um, were really appreciating and getting interested in the various issues that were thrown up. So again, it's always a bit of a shame to have to finish, um, but um, 
uh, it's a discussion obviously that will keep running and I'm aware um, I think is it tomorrow you've got the Young Planners Conference yes, yes. so um, yeah. uh, you know look forward to hearing um, uh, how you go on covering all the various issues um, and, and probably loads more um, along the way too um, and uh, thank you again to to the audience uh, for um, tuning in um, our next uh, session uh, of planning live uh, yes there's the details coming mm -hmm. up um, if you haven't booked um, booking available via our website in the usual way um, we're going to be having a conversation uh, with Pam Ewan uh, who's head of planning at Fife Council but also um, uh, the head of HOPS uh, at the moment and I rather suspect um, that will be a discussion involving a lot of acronyms because I'm sure there'll be NPF, there'll be a discussion about HOPS um, and uh, probably lots more acronyms uh, as well so please do um, book up uh, and join us for that um, and um, uh, hopefully uh, you've all had uh, a good day and you can knock off now that you've done a good job certainly um, uh, all of us can knock off feeling we've done a good job um, and uh, enjoy our Thursday nights so thank you all again and good night thanks thank for you. having us thank you bye now thank you. bye, bye.